Hi, Internet. Cracked writer, performer, frustrated human, Katie Stoll here. So there has been a lot of attention focused on famous men accused of sexual assault lately, the most recent example being Bill Cosby. Now, you're all very smart and diligent purveyors of the news, so I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. But just to refresh your memory, Bill has been accused of sexual assault by 58 women and counting. But only one case, that of Andrea Constant, falls within the statute of limitations and is still prosecutable. The Despite the laundry list of victims and Cosby's own admission that he drugged Miss Constand and engaged in non-consensual sex, the jury was hung and a mistrial was declared. After the verdict, Cosby announced that he would embark on a lecture series to teach people, specifically married men and athletes, how to avoid being accused of sexual assault. Which, okay, first of all, you are so not the person to be delivering that message. You were literally accused by 58 women. And second, this so offensively misses the mark that it would seem like a joke if it weren't 2017 and everything that happens is a satire of itself. Lecturing about ways to avoid being caught instead of actually understanding the issue and getting to the root of the problem is the equivalent of giving a dog chocolate or, I don't know, electing Donald Trump president meaning it's dangerous and cruel. After receiving a lot of backlash, Cosby's spokespeople tried to spin the story, saying the lectures were more about restoring the actor's legacy, which, I'm sorry, is still a big fat pile of f no. Your legacy will never be restored, Bill. There is literally nothing we need to hear you say, except maybe I'm guilty and I apologize. So, to counteract whatever nonsense he may or may not say, I have decided to hold my own lecture series called Things I'd like Bill Cosby and everyone else to understand about rape. First off, I want to applaud you for showing up today. So, I brought treats. <laughs> Here, have a pudding cup. You earned it. A quick note, a lot of what I'm discussing today will focus on women, but to be honest, 3% of American men are victims of sexual assault and most of what we're discussing applies to both sexes. Okay, let's get started with something basic. What is sexual assault? I actually already covered this in my last lecture, how to know if a girl is down to f But just to review, it's really quite simple. You will know if she's DTF if you hear her verbal consent. Now, Bill, in your 2005 testimony on this case, you stated that you don't hear her say anything, you don't feel her say anything, so I proceeded into the area that is somewhere between permission and rejection. I am not stopped. Okay, see, so in this situation, when someone does not consent to having sex with you, it's rape. You see what I'm, what I'm saying right here? Good! Good, we're making progress. That's wonderful. Other things that constitute as sexual assault include groping without permission forcing someone to engage in oral sex, and drugging someone so that they are incapable of saying no. And it doesn't even have to be as insidious as drugging someone. Even if you're out with a person who's had a lot to drink and engage in sex when they aren't coherent, that can constitute as assault. Especially when, as is the case in so many rape cases, consent is revoked and you do not stop. So. If you want to avoid being accused of sexual assault, it's best to just steer clear of those situations altogether. Okay, got it? Cool, we're off to a great start. Here, have another pudding cup, moving on. Psychological effects of assault, or P for short. In any sort of traumatic situation, fight or flight is triggered. Now, a lot of people point to fight or flight as proof that someone wasn't assaulted. The argument being, if they felt threatened and they were scared, why wouldn't they run away? That's kind of dumb, right, Bill? The thing about fight or flight is that it's more applicable to men. A woman's physiological response to a threat isn't to fight, it is to freeze or befriend, which means that many rape victims are too scared to move, let alone resist their attacker. They may even try to defuse the situation so as not to exacerbate the threat. Plus, when your system is flooded with adrenaline but you have no means of escape, your body can short circuit and disassociate from what's happening, which is why so many women have a hard time recounting their assault. It also contributes to victims' feelings of shame, as if they somehow brought the situation upon themselves. These are both big reasons why many victims don't report being raped. Yes, Mr. Cosby, do you have a question? Ah, yes. This is a question I've heard a lot lately, and one I'd like to never hear asked again, please. As mentioned, our body's reaction to trauma can cloud our memories. In fact, our brains might actually block out the memory, provided they were even awake when the assault occurred, right, Bill? Just bad joke. 
It may take weeks or even years for a victim to completely process what happened to them. Plus, there's also the shame of being a victim that's often reinforced by victim blaming, which is the toxic idea that people could have somehow avoided the situation and deserve what happened to them. Moreover, sexual assault victims are afraid of the stigma it carries. Even if they don't feel personally responsible for what happened, they might not want to carry that victimhood with them throughout the rest of their lives. They're afraid that this will affect their desirability for future partners and would prefer to just try and forget about it. For some people, they may even be afraid of what their families or communities might say, which unfortunately is valid. Take Daisy Coleman, the teenage victim of the Maryville rape scandal who experienced death threats, bullying, and whose house was burned to the ground after she was assaulted. Plus, it is difficult to prosecute rape without proof. And in order to file a report, you will need to get a rape kit which is totally traumatizing in its own right. Rape kits are invasive, and victims can expect to be poked, swabbed, sampled. Their pubic hair will be combed for DNA, and photographs will be taken of their injuries. And in order to have the most accurate test results, they recommend that victims don't shower, use the restroom, or change their clothes before taking it. So basically, they just have to like sit in the aftermath of this trauma for hours. So yeah, I can imagine why that isn't the most appealing first stop to make after you've been assaulted especially since they will then have to go talk to the police and police aren't properly trained to handle sexual assault victims or pap sab for short if that helps you remember it. This is maybe the biggest reason why people don't report assault. Victims who file police reports often describe that as being a whole other form of trauma. See, a police officer's job is to investigate, to find the facts, which can be difficult for someone who's just gone through a violent experience and is highly emotional. Plus, Remember what we just discussed about how physical violence and fear can cause disassociation and fragmented memory? Yeah, well, that doesn't go over well under interrogation. Plus, the line of questioning that officers pursue with sexual assault victims include how many times were you penetrated and did you orgasm, which honestly is information I wouldn't want to share with my best friend over coffee, let alone a stranger who inherently doesn't believe me. And believe me when I say that more often than not, they just don't believe you. In fact, one Philadelphia police station affectionately dubbed their sexual crimes unit their lying bitches unit. The truth is that one in five women are victims of sexual assault, and statistically, only two to eight percent of those reports are false. Yet studies have shown that many police officers believe that 50 percent of rape accusations are lies, which is a staggering thing to wrap your brain around until you remember that most people just don't believe that women tell the truth. People think women are liars. This is a really big topic that I don't have time to go too deep into, so I recommend that you check out this HuffPo article about how we teach our children to think that women lie, and this piece from Vox on how we just don't believe rape victims. Both are very dense and well-researched. But it's true. We don't trust women, especially with their emotions. And this is something that I invite everyone, even the most woke among us, to investigate for themselves. Take this piece from Damon Young, who describes the moment he realized that he didn't trust his wife. It isn't that he, he, he didn't trust her on basic things like her loyalty or whether or not she'd kill him in his sleep or whatever. It's that he didn't trust her emotions or her perceptions. And isn't that something that we're all guilty of, both men and women? How many times have you assumed that a woman is overreacting about something or thought that she was being too emotional? When the truth is that most men have been taught from birth to tamper their emotions, to be logical. Male emotional repression can run so deep that they may not even recognize when someone is in actual distress. This is toxic masculinity, and you may not even know that you suffer from it. If a woman you know is emotional, why is her knee-jerk reaction to not trust what she's feeling? Would you say that someone with a headache is lying and ignore the fact that it may be an indication of an actual problem? No, Bill, God damn it, that was a rhetorical question. Just have another goddamn pudding cup, okay? We're almost done. So how do we fix this? Given all of these factors, it's understandable why more people don't come forward with their stories of sexual assault. And the answer might seem overly simplistic, but well, here goes. One, don't do the rape. And two, believe people when they tell you they've been assaulted. Also, things are changing. California has already removed their statute of limitations law and other states are following suit. Research to see if your state is included and if not, start a petition to make it happen. So Bill, as you can see, it's probably best that you stay as far away from this topic as possible because you have nothing of value to add to the conversation. Unless you wanna play this video. Honestly, I would love that. 
Because these are the kinds of conversations we do need to be having. If we really want to solve this problem, we need to focus on listening and empathy, not ways to avoid being caught. Okay, class, that about does it for us today. I know I made a big deal about that quiz thing, but honestly, I was lying. And yeah, no, I mean, I know I said that you can trust me, and you totally can in general. It's just, I'd be boring to watch. And <laughs> this already isn't really a comedy video, is it? But we are gonna end with some trust falls, okay? That's fun. Everyone, partner up. No, Bill. I don't wanna be your partner, Bill. Because I don't trust you, Bill, obviously. Yeah. Hey guys, thanks for watching. Click the C to subscribe. Click the bell to be alerted when we release more content. And while you're at it, why don't you check out some of these videos that are highlighted next to me? I promise they're pretty good.